Okay, how's this for a question to start the program? Why did Adolf Hitler insist on wearing that stupid mustache? Was it because, A, he really thought he looked good with that thing, or B, he was an admirer of the actor Charlie Chaplin who had something similar, or C, was there another reason? If you chose C, you're right. The real answer was apparently found in a super obscure essay written by a guy who served in the trenches with Hitler back in World War I. Everyone in the unit was under orders to wear gas masks to protect against chemical attacks from the British. But these masks didn't fit very well, especially if he had a big stash. So Hitler was simply following orders. He trimmed his big stash back so it would fit inside the mask. The result was one of the most evil and sinister and recognizable looks in the history of the species. In other words, the Hitler mustache was a fluke of fashion. Was it the thing that made him so evil? Well, probably not, but certainly couldn't have helped. By the way, some neurological historians believe that the reason Hitler lost the war was because he had a form of Parkinson's disease that impaired his decision-making abilities. He couldn't make up his mind about what to do in late 1944 and early 1945, and the Nazis end up losing. Just a bit of bonus trivia for you. Let's try something else, something a little more uh, uh, musical. A lot of people email me questions, and I thought we'd spend an hour going through some of them. Oh, uh, there, there's one now. It's a question uh, from Ian in Calgary. He asks, is it true that Bubbles from the Trailer, trailer Park Boys used to be in a band that had a hit record in had a hit record in Canada. Oh crap. Hey, give me a second, okay? Now, the ongoing history of new music. Okay, uh, sorry, Ian from Calgary. Let me play you this first and then we'll get to your question about bubbles from the Trailer Park Boys. This is from the summer of 1996.
from a place called Pick Two County, Nova Scotia. That's a band called Sandbox with a track entitled Curious. It was a single from a 1996 album released on Network Records called Bionic. Sandbox won three East Coast Music Awards and were nominated for a Juno before they broke up and one of the guys in the band decided he'd rather go to medical school than be in a group. Mike Smith, one of the guitarists, took a job as a sound man in movies and television. He had this character that he did using a pair of really thick glasses a girlfriend found for him in a Texas flea market. And while goofing around on the set of a 1999 movie called The Trailer Park Boys, everyone really liked the character so much that they wrote Mike into the movie. And this is how Mike Smith, guitarist from the Juno-nominated Sandbox, became Bubbles, the trailer park boy, who now sings songs like... Um, Lecker and Horse, take two. Well, like this... I met a girl, she was nice, she was pretty and pleasing. She said, hey boy, we should do some marrying. And I said, sure, but before we do, there's something that you should know. I like liquor, liquor and whores, liquor and and dope and mustard and baloney, liquor and oil. Welcome to the show. I'm Alan Cross, and this is a program all about you. Or, more specifically, some of the questions that people have sent in through www.ongoinghistory.com. There's a link marked Ask a Music Geek Question. And uh, let me tell you something. People from around the world use that link a lot. Now, before we go any further, let me apologize if you sent me an email and I didn't get back to you. I get about 500 messages a day. And it's pretty much impossible to keep up with the replies. But I do read every single email that comes in. And I put aside some of the more interesting music-related questions so we can do shows like this. So Ian's question about bubbles from the Trailer Park Boys is out of the way. Let's try something else. This is one of the most common ones. It's from Lisa in Toronto. It's from Charlene from Toronto. It's from Lyle from Brampton, George in London, Allison from Hamilton, Todd from Canmore, and, well, just a lot of people asked about this one. And usually the email goes something like this. There's a weird spoken word song done in a Cockney-type accent about making a piece of toast. What is that all about? The group is called Street Band. This was a five-piece formed in England back in 1977. They released an indie single on Logo Records in 1978 called Hold On. And frankly, Hold On was an awful song. In fact, it was so bad that several DJs at the BBC flipped the record over in hopes that there was something listenable on the B-side. And this is where Street Band and a lot of other people got lucky. On side two of the single was a song about the simple pleasures of making a piece of toast. Apparently the guys in Street Band had come up with the song on stage during a moment when they needed to stretch for time. And when it came time to record their single, they decided to slap this, this jam on the B-side. Now, when this record came out... England was paralyzed by a series of strikes. There was a garbage strike, a miners' strike, a nurses' strike, and a strike of all the bakers, the people who made the nation's bread. It was almost impossible for a while to buy a loaf of bread anywhere, and suddenly this obscure B-side pops up. No wonder this song worked its way up to number 18 on the British charts that fall. They even performed the song live on the weekly British chart show Top of the Pops. <sighs> Morning, all. I'd like to tell you about when I was a young boy. I must have been three or four months old at the time. I didn't really know what I wanted, and if I did, I wouldn't have been able to tell anybody because all I could do was gurgle. So I sat there in my eye chair, thinking one day, 
looking at me tray and thinking, what I'd give for a meal on there. So I started looking around to see what I could have. I was rubbing my eggy soldier in my head, trying to think. And then I looked in the corner, and there's a little bread bin with its mouth open, just staring at me like. And then I looked in, and I saw bread. I thought, oh, yeah, I'll have toast. A little piece of toast. Well, then I started getting older. I hated this, I hated that. Expensive steak was ludicrous and cafes couldn't cater for the finer things in life. The upper crust was not for me. I could tell that. So I'd go back home, switch the kitchen light on, put the grill on, slip a slice under and have toast. A little piece of toast. Because there's so much to choose from. There's brown bread, white bread, all sorts of wholemeal bread. It comes in funny packages with writing on the side. But it doesn't matter which one you have. Because when you cut the crust off, have it with marmalade or butter, cheese, tomatoes, beans, banana or chocolate. If it's strange, it doesn't really matter. Oh, no, it all goes with toast. Just toast. I'm going to think about it some. to another trying to find the bread store but I can't find it anywhere and then I bump into a mother with a baby in a basket and she says oh let you start him off again I'll come down with a little bit of peace and quiet and get some bread to go home to make toast just toast I like toast yeah but I don't half like toast okay scrape that toast boys that's toast. Mm, yeah, just toast. I can't think about it anymore. I've got to go and have some. It's no good. Hey, listen, I'm getting a bit brand off staying in here. Me too. Should we go and have some toast? It's a good idea. Why not? Okay. I've got the grill on. Got any brown bread? Yeah. I've got whole meal bread. Toast. Wheat meal bread. Toast. All sorts of toast. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's go. Don't so worry, don't worry about it. Yeah. band two words with their 1978 epic toast that song ended up being both the group's biggest hits and biggest liability when people came out to see street band they expected some quirky english outfit and said they got this loud fairly conventional rock band so essentially toast destroyed their credibility completely and even though street band released a half dozen straight ahead rock and roll singles they were all miserable failures and street band broke up for good in 1979 and descended into obscurity say for this one song, and for one member. Keyboardist Paul Young went on to a solo career and did very well with a series of hit singles through the early and middle 1980s. In fact, you might remember this song.
Paul Young from 1985, an alumnus from Street Band. If you've been searching for a copy of Street Band's Toast, you might be able to find it on an imported Paul Young CD called The Early Years. The label is VSOP. It's really hard to find now. I actually held it in my hand at one point, and I thought, eh, 30 bucks, and I'll put it back. And I wish I hadn't. But there's always the Internet. This is why God invented the Internet, if you know what I'm saying. More answers to more questions from you in just seconds. This is the ongoing history of new music. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. Welcome back. I'm Alan Cross, and I'm kind of cleaning out my inbox with this show. I'm trying to get to all the questions that people have sent me through www.ongoinghistory.com. And let me tell you something, there's a lot of questions. And not all of them have to do with music. Dear Alan, is it true that a Twinkie contains so many preservatives and chemicals that they will effectively last forever? That's from Laura in Ottawa. Actually, Laura, that's an urban myth. The safe, effective lifetime of a Twinkie on the shelf is 25 days. And like any food beyond its best before date, I wouldn't eat it. Here's a good one from Brenda, who listens online from somewhere in the middle of Saskatchewan. Do you happen to know Donald Duck's middle name? I don't know why she's asking. Um, but I happen to know it's Fauntleroy. Donald Fauntleroy Duck. Go, go look it up. And let's get back to music. This is from David in Calgary. Dear Alan, with the reunion of the Smashing Pumpkins in 2007, it got me thinking, whatever happened to Darcy, the original bass player for the Smashing Pumpkins? This is a great question. Hardcore Pumpkins fans will remember that Darcy Elizabeth Retzke met Billy Corgan and guitarist James Eha outside a club in Chicago in 1988. And she sort of muscled her way into the new group, which would later become known as the Smashing Pumpkins. She and James were romantically involved for a while, from 1988 to about 1991, actually. Well, they were, in, they were engaged. But then they broke up in the middle of the tour for their first album, and uh, well, then they had to stay working together in the band for the rest of its existence. The story was that in 1999, Darcy quit the Pumpkins to pursue a career in acting. The following year, January 25th, 2000, she was busted on crack cocaine charges. Cops on the west side of Chicago found her holding three bags of crack after the car in which she was a passenger made a couple of dumb and illegal U-turns. Darcy was arrested, but not formally charged. Instead, she received a court-ordered drug rehab program. Now, Darcy is originally from Michigan, and as far as anyone knows... That's where she is now, living on her horse farm near a place called Watervillette, Michigan, which is just off I-94 east of Kalamazoo. Apparently, she raises some really great Arabian horses, and she owns three antique shops. I've also heard she's now a trained massage therapist. And in case you're wondering, nothing seems to have come from those acting aspirations. If anybody knows any more about Darcy, let me know. Here are the pumpkins from the glory days of the Siamese Dream album, after Darcy and James broke up, but before the horse farm, the massages, and the crack.
The Smashing Pumpkins featuring bass player turned massage therapist and Arabian horse expert Darcy Retsky. Okay, next question. This is from Greg in Toronto. I'm trying to remember the name of a song in the band who did it. It's from the early 80s and was probably done by a local indie band. The lyric goes, I have a rubber in my wallet. I just can't wait to install it. It has a reinforced border. I hope it's still in working order. I'm sure you remember. It's a funny tune. Anyway, I'd appreciate it if you could email me the name of the song of the band. Love to find it somewhere. Many thanks. Greg. Okay, this is easy. It's a track by The Extras called Circular Impression. They're a Toronto band who recorded on the Ready Records label in the early 1980s. The guys in the group were part of the backup band for another Canadian from the era named B.B. Gabor. The Extras broke up and scattered. I know that one of the guys got a job as a chef or a professional cook. And I also know that they digitally remastered and re-released a lot of songs on a CD called Ripe in 2004. And I got your song. Once again, it's called Circular Impression by The Extras. I've got a rubber in my wallet One of those little what you call it I'm saving it for that special day When the right girl comes my way It leaves a circular impression from all those years of compression I've had it since I turned 13 I got it in a vein machine tinfoil packet Sometimes I'm tempted to unwrap it It's got a reinforced border I hope it's still in working order Be prepared they said in Boy Scouts I'm waiting for a chance to try it out I want to try this contraceptive But all the girls are unreceptive French safe in my pocket It'll be the nose cone on my rocket It comes direct from Paris, France Can't wait to take it from my pants <laughs> Extras with Circular Impression, a song from 1981, back in the days when you weren't supposed to talk about condoms on the radio, or just about anywhere else for that matter. It was impolite. I get a lot of questions from people asking about collectible and rare records. Usually somebody comes across something in their collection and wants to know if it's worth anything. Well, setting a value on a record or a CD used to be a difficult thing. See, how much a record is worth is dependent on its condition, its rarity, and how much demand there is for it in the marketplace. You could have a one-of-a-kind recording on purple vinyl that was released and deleted on the same day in Cambodia, but if nobody cares, it's not worth anything. Prices used to be set by dealers and hardcore collectors and at places like record fairs. Magazines like Record Collector and Goldmine published annual price guides. In fact, Record Collector still does, and it's used by collectors worldwide. Finding buyers and sellers could also be tough, but then things change with the Internet, especially with eBay. There's also a great site called www.gem.com, and you spell gem with two M's, G-E-M-M.com. You can also look up a site called www.991.com. And now it's easy and quick to find out how much a record is worth or how worthless it may be. The downside of all this Internet connectivity is that prices, in some cases, have spiked dramatically. Now, that being said, here's a question from James. He says that he recently acquired a vinyl collection from a friend. And in this collection was a Sex Pistols 7-inch of Pretty Vacant. It's the original release on Virgin Records, 1977, and carries the serial number of VS184. Some guy in New Zealand was selling a copy for $510 U.S. 
<laughs> wow, it's pretty good. But wait, let's go to the record collector price guide. Here it is. The Sex Pistols, Pretty Vacant, Serial, VS-184, 1977 issue, picture sleeve, some with push-out center. If your copy is in mint condition, the prevailing market price for this 7-inch single is 5 pounds, which is just over 11 bucks Canadian. Dude, if a guy can get 510 U.S. for what amounts to an $11 record, all the power to him. This is a prime example of buyer beware. Sex Pistols in Pretty Vacant, originally released in 1977 as a 7-inch single on Virgin Records, serial number VS-184, and worth about $11. Sorry, James. Which reminds me, uh, I guess we should do another show on collectibles in the near future. Okay, can you can write that down? Yeah, okay. Coming up next, the three most asked questions of this show of all time. Definitive answers in seconds. <laughs> This is the Ongoing History of New Music. You're tuned to the Ongoing History of New Music. Like I was saying earlier, I get hundreds of emails a day, which adds up to thousands per year. And if I had to name the three most commonly asked questions I get, it would be these ones. Question. Are the two people in the white stripes, Jack and Meg White, actually brother and sister? Answer. For once and for all, they are not brother and sister. They are actually ex-husband and wife. John Anthony Gillis met Megan Martha White in Detroit in 1994. She was a bartender at a place called Memphis Smoke, and he was an ex-furniture upholsterer. 
They were married on September 12, 1996, and in a reversal of tradition, Jack took Meg's last name. They started a band, they released a couple of albums, but then on March 24, 2000, they were divorced. However, they obviously remained friends and bandmates. So, where did this brother and sister thing start? Actually, as a joke, when the White Stripes started, both Jack and Meg insisted that they were brother and sister. But when they got famous, the truth was outed, yet some people refused to believe it. But take it from me, Jack and Meg White are not brother and sister, never have been brother and sister, they are ex-husband and wife. The White Stripes featuring Jack and Meg White less than a year after their divorce. Fell in love with a girl from 2001. Okay. The next most asked question is, what exactly does the guy say at the end of Radiohead's Just video? Now to review. Just is a song from their 1995 album, The Bands. The video clip, directed by James Thraves, features the band playing the song in an apartment. On the street below, a well-dressed man suddenly decides to lie down in a fetal position in the middle of a busy sidewalk. He won't get up. Dialogue between the man and passers-by is done with subtitles. He says he's not crazy and that he's not drunk. He just wants to lie there and not get up. But near the end of the video, he finally decides to tell everyone why he is actually lying there. However, the subtitles cut out, and the editing gets pretty choppy. It's impossible to tell, even with lip-reading, what this guy says. But whatever he has to say, it has an impact, and everybody suddenly lies down on the sidewalk. So there's the question. What does he say that's so convincing? This has bugged Radiohead fans for years and years and years. And here's the bad news. That's the point. We're not supposed to know what the man says. It's supposed to be a mystery that leaves us wondering. Ever see the movie Lost in Translation with Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson? He whispers something in her ear at the end, but we don't know what he said. This is the same thing with the Just video. Besides, if you knew, that would just deaden the mystery. And where would the fun be in all that? Change your life. 
Radiohead and Just, the song with the video with the mystery. Now, of course, there are many, many, many theories about what the well-dressed businessman says, but they are all wrong. Even the people who made the video, including the band, have no idea what the man says. Again, that's the point. And finally, the third most asked question is this one. Do you think that Kurt Cobain was murdered? My short answer to this is no. Now, there are all sorts of unanswered questions. How did Kurt manage to inject himself with a massive overdose of heroin, put his gear away, and then maneuver the shotgun in time before the drugs knocked him out? What about the fact that the handwriting on the suicide note appears to change? Who was using Kurt's credit card in the hours and days after he died? Why didn't anyone think to check the room above the garden house when they were searching for him? There's more, but you get the idea. In fact, there's been enough for documentaries and books and websites devoted to the subject. Heck, there were even a couple of ongoing history shows on the whole controversy of Kurt's death. But there's something called Occam's Razor, which can basically be summed up as this. The simplest answer is usually the correct one. Kurt was a depressed, unhealthy, hardcore heroin addict who hung around with some very weird and bad people. He had an obsession with guns and was certifiably suicidal. None of that is in dispute. His body was so used to heroin that a dose that would have killed a regular person instantly had a delayed effect on him. Enough for him to put a syringe away and aim the gun. That's basically it. Now, I like a conspiracy theory as much as the next guy. I mean, don't get me started on the JFK assassination. But in all honesty, I think the whole Kurt was murdered thing is just chasing shadows. But then again, I could be wrong. I'm so happy because today from my friends are in my head. I'm so ugly, that's okay, cause so are you, look on me, it's Sunday morning, it's every day for all I care, and I'm not scared, light my candles in our days, cause I found God, yeah!
Nirvana with Lithium. Back in a second with the answer to a bonus question, which, now that I think about it, is probably the most asked question that I get. Hold on. This is the ongoing history of new music. You're tuned to the ongoing history of new music. Okay, before we finish up, I have to answer this one final question. I, now that I think of it, get this one more than every other question combined. Here it is. Can I download full ongoing history shows so I can listen to my iPod and car later? The answer is no. Under current copyright laws, we cannot offer complete shows for download. That's because the shows contain music. It is illegal under the current laws for us to distribute this music, music of other people, with our product without their permission. And we cannot get permission. Well, you know what? That's not true. We probably could in some cases, but it would cost way too much. And this is also why we've never been able to release ongoing history shows on CD. The cost and the hassle and the legalities and the paperwork is just insurmountable. And believe me, we've tried. We can do the one-minute daily feature podcast because those don't feature any music, any copyrighted music. And there's also something called Ongoing History Raw, which is essentially a select number of shows with all the music taken out. It's just me talking. If that appeals to you, great. They're there for the taking, and they're free at the official website of this program. The address is www.ongoinghistory.com. And you can get the podcasts through the iTunes Music Store. You just launch a search, and you'll find them. Believe me, I would love to podcast this show in its entirety, music included, but it's against the law. However, I can offer a number of things at www.ongoinghistory.com. Under current copyright rules, it is 100% legal to stream shows. There's a legal mechanism for that. We pay a royalty and performance fee to do that. There's no mechanism like that in place for podcasts, at least not yet. There's a distinction that has to be made. So... Feel free to surf over and browse through hundreds of past shows. You can stream any one of them through your computer whenever you want. If you would rather read past shows, you can do that. There are hundreds of specially written transcripts available. Again, www.ongoinghistory.com. There's also my Music Geek blog, which is updated five times a week. There's a schedule for upcoming shows. And, of course, a place where you can ask a Music Geek question, which is where I got all the questions for this show. So send me some more, and we'll do another program like this again www.ongoinghistory.com Technical production for the show is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to The Ongoing History of New Music, a Deep Sky production. 